Ladies and gentlemen, honored guests, friends, free, uh, beaming in from around the, uh, around the globe, good morning. Thanks for, thanks for being here today. My name is Rick Santos. On behalf of my company, Santos Knight Frank, thank you for joining us today for, for what is the fifth session of our webinar series about the impact of COVID-19 on the Philippine real estate sector. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge our partners for this webinar, the British Chamber of Commerce of the Philippines, and of course, our speakers and guests. First of all, Secretary Bernadette Romulo Puyat, head of the Department of Tourism, Under Secretary Benito Bengson of the Department of Tourism, Peggy Angeles, Executive Vice President of SM Hotels and Conventions, uh, Arthur Gindap, Senior Vice President and Business Unit G GM for the Robbins Hotel and Resorts, Bruce Winton, the Cluster General Manager for Marriott International Philippines, and Art Lopez, the President of the Philippine Hotel Owners Association. Welcome. We're also pleased to welcome the members and boards of our partner organizations, the Philippine Hotel Owners Association, Art Lopez, the Hotel Restaurant Association of the Philippines and its president, Eugene Yap, Hotel Resort and Restaurant Association of Cebu and its president, Carlo Suarez, Hotel Sales and Marketing Association with its chairman, Marge Munsayak, and also president and uh, Christine Ann Ibarreta, Thanks to everyone for making the time today, and I'm grateful that you've been able to join us. Over the last two months, our webinars about COVID 2019's impact on the property sector have garnered more than 20,000 attendees. Today, we will focus on a vital sector in the Philippine economy, the hotel and leisure industry. By way of introduction, Santos Knight Frank is a leading full service real estate advisory company in the Philippines. We founded the company back in 1994 and we provide the full range of professional services from commercial real estate, uh, leasing and sales, valuation, capital markets, facilities and property management, and other market leading services, including hotel and leisure advisory. Our global reach spans to 60 territories and more than 500 countries worldwide, covering the US, Europe, the Middle East, and strengthen Asia Pacific. For over a quarter of a century, we at Santos Knight Frank are proud to have been the leading and trusted advisor to the hotel sector in the Philippines. We've sold key properties across the country and advise on the expansion of some of the biggest local and international brands. So if you need help buying, selling, financing, rebranding, let us know. The hotel sector has been a key part of our strategy since day one. We are proud to have a dedicated hotel advisory team focused on providing a unique set of skill sets and services to our clients. This is of special interest because as a kid uh, surfing in the Philippines or, 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 or diving here uh, or traveling around the country all the way from Baguio to Basilan, there's no more beautiful country in the world than the Philippines and no more beautiful country to see uh, and uh, visit as part of the hotel tourism sector. To get us started, I'm very pleased to welcome Bill Bailey, the chairman of the British Chamber of Commerce of the Philippines. Bill, over to you. Uh, thank you, Rick, and to everyone at Santos Knight Frank, a longtime platinum member of our chamber. Uh, it's a great privilege to speak on behalf of the British Chamber of Commerce in the Philippines this morning and to welcome each and every one of you to this webinar. The British Chamber has grown to a membership of more than 300, the highest in our history. Our members represent companies from across all industry sectors and include those with di uh, direct British links and many others from a wide spectrum of owners and investors in the Philippines, including, of course, the hotel and tourism sector. If you're not yet a Chamber member, we look forward to you joining soon and welcoming you. Since 2013, we have worked in a groundbreaking partnership with the UK government driving their trade and investment uh, initiatives. Through this program, we've introduced many companies to the Philippines and promoted bilateral relationships between our nations. Since March, we have moved from live events to running an extensive program of webinars covering a multitude of sectors and issues. Today's webinar focuses on the hotel industry, which is a key sector in the Philippine economy. The world is beginning to emerge from the black swan event that is COVID-19. And now we face some of the toughest economic conditions for the last century. Tourism and business travel have been deeply affected. We are now looking at a new normal and how we can restart stored economies across the planet. We very much look forward to a strong bounce back in the Philippine tourism industry. We have a great lineup today, and I look forward to hearing the perspectives of many industry leaders from the hospitality sector as to what they believe lies ahead. 
It's now my honor to introduce our keynote speaker for today. Bernadette Romulo Puat is the Secretary of, De of the Department of Tourism after being appointed by President Duterte in 2018. She attended the University of the Philippines where she pursued an undergraduate and a master's degree in economics and where she subsequently served as a lecturer. Her career in public services includes economic consultant of the Housing and Urban Development Coordination Council, Presidential Management Staff, Deputy Cabinet Secretary at the Office of the President, Under Secretary at the Department of Agriculture, handling special concerns, administration and finance, and agribusiness and marketing. As I am sure you can imagine, Secretary Puyat has an extremely busy schedule and is actually unable to join us live on this webinar. However, she has been kind enough to record a message for us. Thank you to everyone for joining and supporting the British Chamber of Commerce. Thank you. Mr. Bill Bailey, Chairman of the British Chamber of Commerce of the Philippines. Mr. Rick Santos, Chairman and CEO of Santos Knight Frank. Mr. Chris Nelson, Executive Director and Trustee of the British Chamber of Commerce of the Philippines. Mr. Arthur Lopez, President of the Philippine Hotel Owners Association. Mr. Arthur Gindap, Senior Vice President and Business Unit Head General Manager of Robinson's Hotel and Resorts. Ms. Margie Monsaya, Chairman of the Board of the Hotel Sales and Marketing Association. Ms. Christine Ann Ibareta, President of the Hotel Sales and Marketing Association. Ms. Rose Libongo, Virtus Chair of Hotel Sales and Marketing Association, Ms. Peggy Angeles, Executive Vice President of SM Hotels and Conventions Corporation, Mr. Bruce Winston, Cluster General Manager of Marriott International Philippines, my colleague in the Department of Tourism, USEC Undersecretary Benito Benson Jr. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It's a pleasure to be here today and thank you for inviting me to share with you what the Department of Tourism is planning for the recovery of the tourism industry. I hope this presentation will offer insights that will help inform your investment strategies as you navigate the post-COVID-19 world. Before we enter this crisis, Philippine tourism was experiencing its best year ever. In 2019, the Tourism Direct Cross Value Added, or TDGVA, amounted to 2.48 trillion, which accounted for 12.7% of the gross domestic product. A 10.8% increase from the previous year's GDP contribution of 2.24 trillion. Inbound tourism ranked second among the biggest export items with a share of 9.9% of the country's total exports, second to semiconductors. Inbound tourism expenditure posted the highest growth in 2019 at 23.2%, followed by domestic tourism expenditure at 10.4%. Domestic tourism expanded 2.85 trillion in 2018 to 3.14 trillion in 2019. It's worth noting that about 10.8% of the 12.7% of the GDP share is from domestic tourism, making it the biggest contributor to the tourism industry. Domestic tourism expenditure also represents 22% of the household's final consumption expenditure. 14 out of 100 Filipinos were employed in tourism in 2019. 5.71 million were employed in tourism industry, higher by 6.5% compared to the 5.36 million from the previous year. Share of the employment in tourism industries to total employment in the country was recorded at 13.5%. This shows tourism's important contribution to the economy in terms of productivity and employment generation. The tourism sector achieved record numbers in 2019, 
with international tourist arrivals of 8.26 million, representing a 15.2% increase from the previous year. I will go quickly um, over the impact of COVID-19 pandemic to the tourism industry. Needless to say, it was one of the hardest hit industries due to the pandemic. For the first five months of 2020, visitor arrivals totaling 1.3 million indicated a 62.21% drop compared to the same period in 2019. Total inbound revenue from January to May also decreased, reaching an estimated 81.05 billion or a 60.56% decrease from 205.5 billion recorded in the same period last year. It is worth noting that January of this year, we had an 8% increase, both for tourism arrivals and revenues. As the public health emergency began unfolding in March, the Department of Tourism quickly set to work assisting our most immediately affected stakeholders, travelers who were stranded across the islands. More than 38,000 foreign and local tourists were transported through sweeper flights, sea and land transfers, and given tourist care kits. The Department of Tourism also formed a 24-7 online response team to help coordinate stranded passengers with relevant agencies and answer queries related to the ECQ. Hotels were transformed into accommodations for frontliners and essential workers who were affected by the halt of public trans transportation. Presently, many of the hotels in NCR are also being used as quarantine facilities for OFWs and returning overseas Filipinos. In the early days of the crisis, Congress passed Republic Act 11469, or the Bayanihan to Heal as One Act, which authorized the President to exercise emergency powers to carry out urgent measures to address the current national emergency. Pursuant to the Bayanihan Act, the Department of Tourism developed a tourism response and recovery plan in coordination with other national government agencies and the tourism stakeholders through the Tourism Congress of the Philippines. Seeing how the quarantine measures affected not only large-scale tourism businesses, but also medium, small, and micro-tourism enterprises, especially community-based ones, it was vital for the Department of Tourism to implement urgent mitigation packages to protect jobs and ensure business viability during and after the crisis. The DOT's immediate response actions with respect to the TRRP included several measures like placing a moratorium on accreditation fees, which is actually very important now because no establishment can be allowed to operate without DOT accreditation and a certificate of authority to operate. Waiving participation fees in international trade shows until 2021, assisting with the wage subsidy programs of various departments, the deferment of tourism workers' contributions to SSS, PhilHealth, and PAGIBIG, and the deferment of corporate income tax payments to the BIR. The TRRP serves as the master plan of the Department of Tourism in navigating the industry towards recovery over the next two or three years by developing business recovery and continuity plans with tourism stakeholders, providing physical assistance for tourism industry players, and increasing tourist confidence to travel to and within the Philippines. I am happy to announce that the Accelerated Recovery and Investment Stimulus for the Economy of the Philippines, or ARISE PH, was approved by the House of Representatives on the third and final reading last June 4, which stands to assist the tourism sector with 58 billion pesos that can be used for tourism-related enterprises, enterprises, mostly MSMEs. Arise PH will cover and enable the following programs in line with the TRRP. First, interest rate free loans 
or issuance of loan guarantees with terms of up to five years administered by government financial institutions such as the Land Bank of the Philippines and the Development Bank of the Philippines to credit facilities also through GFIs or government financial institutions for upgrading of current establishments to be compliant with new health standards. Third, marketing and product development promotions and programs. Fourth, grants for education, training, and advising for tourism stakeholders for new normal alternative livelihood programs. Fifth, utilization of information technology for the improvement of tourism services, development of a tourist tracking system for emergency response, and establishment of spatial database to improve planning capacity. Number six, any other relevant program, including infrastructure necessary to mitigate the economic effects of COVID-19 on the tourism industry. The DOT is also advocating for the passage of the Bayanihan to Recover as One Act, which aims to extend the validity of programs and interventions laid out under Republic Act 11469 or the Bayanihan to Heal as One Act, as well as to provide additional funding of 10 billion pesos to the Department of Tourism for its response and recovery programs. As we transition into the new normal, and slowly but surely restart tourism, we share the optimism of the United Nations World Tourism Organization, or the UNWTO, which believes in the revival of the Philippine tourism industry. UNWTO Secretary General Surab Pololikashvili himself expressed that he is confident that the Philippines can restart and recover. Already, Forbes magazine has named the Philippines as one of the seven countries that have, and I quote, the potential to become a major tourist destination in a post-COVID world, citing that the archipelago has something to offer even for the most finicky of tourists. We are also pleased with the inclusion of the hidden beach in El Nido, Palawan, in Condé Nast travelers, the 30 best beaches in the world feature. Historically, in times of crisis, the domestic market has always driven tourism recovery. And that is what we will focus on in the next few months. We're starting domestic tourism carefully and in phases will bring back jobs while implementing and institutionalizing the new health protocols. Domestic tourism actually accounts for 10.8% of the 12.7% GDP share of the tourism industry. With or without the pandemic, it remains the driving force of tourism's growth and development. Although leisure travel is already permitted between modified GCQ areas, several local governments have expressed their intent to reopen only when they are 100% ready to handle tourists. Based on the preliminary results of a survey we launched with the Guide of the Philippines and the Asian Institute of Management, the number one activity that people are looking forward to is Sun and Beach. Following this are road trips, which is in line with how we foresee the gradual reopening of tourism. Traveling by land to nearby destinations will be primary mode of transportation in these early phases. Travel distances will initially be short and most likely intra-municipality or intra-province. Eventually, domestic travelers will go farther distances and start taking flights once made available. Tourism activities in the short and medium term will be characterized by shifts in traveler behavior and expectations among them First will be health and safety will continue to be the primary consideration in travel decisions. Travelers will ask detailed questions on the situation in a destination or establishment and availability and proximity of medical facilities and services. Second, there will be an increased utilization of digital platforms in securing information on travel options booking flights and accommodations, and transacting in general. 
this is part of the shift to cashless and contactless transactions. Third, more consumers will probably prefer small group but high value experiential travel. As physical distancing protocols must continue to be observed, there will be less of mass groups that we see or that we saw prior to the pandemic. Last week, we had partially opened Boracay Island to the Western Visayas as requested by the local government units. Stringent measures are in place, especially during port entry, and some recreational activities that gather crowds are not allowed. Swimming, sunbathing, and strolling along, along Boracay's famous shores is permitted as long as physical distancing is observed. Eventually, travel bubbles or corridors will play an important part in jumpstarting international travel. These involve mutual agreements between cooperating countries to allow regulated travel in select safe places. Given that we have 7,641 islands and 12 international airports, travel bubbles or corridors can be explored between ours and other countries, COVID-free destinations, most likely starting with short-haul flights, such as those in the ASEAN region. Allow me now to focus on the theme of safe travel and what the Department of Tourism is working on. Inspired by the UNWTO's Travel Tomorrow campaign, we continue to maintain the strong presence of the Philippines in the international travel scene. The Wake Up in the Philippines campaign features video advertisements, 360 degree underwater virtual tours, instructional cooking videos by featured Filipino chefs, and other new activities to inspire future travelers to keep the Philippines in mind once we can all travel again. Here's a short preview. We also develop and release safety guidelines for accommodation establishments, tourist transportation, and restaurants in light of the new normal, based on protocols issued by the World Health Organization and the Department of Health. Most of these are enhanced measures for cleanliness, sanitation, physical distancing, contact tracing, and PPEs for our tourism workers. These important guidelines highlight our safety first policy to ensure the well being and security of our visitors. Violation of these guidelines may subject the tourism enterprise to the appropriate fines and penalties, including the cancellation of the DOT accreditation in accordance with relevant laws and regulations. When the world's border closed, and people were stuck at home, they remained closely connected, using digital platforms to go to class, attend conferences, and work from home. Even if we do return to the an old normal scenario, the pervasiveness of technology will only increase, and so innovation and adopting new technologies are especially important for MSMEs to survive. The Department of Tourism is advocating for capacity building efforts to retool our tourism stakeholders. 
In the absence of food bazaars, we have helped various local food suppliers and growers through our Philippine Harvest Movement, connect with customers through online marketing, purchase, and delivery platforms. We are also partnering with inclusion tech venture builder Talino Venture Labs to provide digital solutions for MSMEs to move forward in the new normal. A couple of the products they have developed are SafePass, which is an incident management platform for physical establishments that will automate space capacity planning, contact tracing, and protocol enforcement. Eat-In, on the other hand, is an application that will help restaurants transition to digital ordering, kitchen management, and cashless transactions. Both apps, SafePass, Express, and Eat-In Express are available for free to all DOT accredited establishments. The DOT has also been offering a series of online courses for tourism enterprises and workers to prepare them for the new normal. Topics dealt with digitalization and e-commerce, as well as a module on the Filipino brand of service during the time of pandemic. The caring attitude of the Filipinos in handing guests was highlighted when the DOT assisted thousands of stranded tourists during this pandemic. I am pleased to report that the Philippines Board of Investments, or the BOI, has responded positively to the Department of Tourism's request to amend their current rules to allow tourism and tourism-related industries to avail of investment incentives for upgrading and modernizing their facilities and ensure compliance with health, safety, and wellness protocols that will adopt to the new normal. What will ordinarily be treated as an expense during these times will now be treated as an investment entitled to incentives. These incentives will then give the tourism and tourism-related establishments the space needed for business continuity, sustainability, and resiliency. The investment incentives to be granted by the BOI are as follows. First, income tax holiday for a period of three years and duty-free importation of capital equipment, but only that will be paid. The income tax holiday to be given will be prorated according to the amount of upgrade or renovation. These incentives for modernization may be availed as well in areas such as Boracay, where there are current local restrictions for new and expansion of tourism facilities. Along with this particular amendment, which is inclusive in character by the BOI and the DOT, we also expanded the redefinition to include, aside from hotels and resorts, MICE hotels and tourist transport companies. Other examples of renovations or upgrades that can qualify for such investment incentives include renovations of guest rooms, food and beverage outlets, of function meeting rooms, recreation areas, and or other common areas, investments in new or upgrade of laundry, kitchen, housekeeping, employee facilities, and other back of house facilities, building of full, partial, or movable partitions, installation of built-in thermal scanners, hygiene gates, and our booths, upgrade or improvement of ventilation, air conditioning, air filtration systems, water systems, water treatment facilities, or STP, a mobile check-in system, non-touch or no-contact door lock systems, and non-touch control panels in elevators and other areas. Tourism-related businesses may now apply for the BOI Investment Incentive Program online in five steps, which we will share with you later on, including the forms you need to fill up and submit. These amendments introduced by the BOI with the DOT are enabling in character. We will continue to work closely with the BOI and the Department of Trade and Industry on this concern. Even as the world opens up and more countries have begun to loosen their restrictions, we will remain vigilant in observing minimum health and safety protocols in order to prevent recurring waves of infections. 
safely restarting domestic tourism will build trust and confidence in international markets and entice them back to our shores. We may not be able to achieve our 2019 tourism levels for this year, but we plan to get there in a sustainable manner. The DOT will continue with support to its stakeholders with financial and policy measures, online tools, and guidelines for the new normal safety standards. We believe in the resiliency of the industry, but recovery is a collaborative effort that will require cooperation and compliance among all those involved. The day when we can once travel once again is getting closer. I hope to see you in one of our destinations soon and that you can see that even if we have enforced all these safety and health protocols, that it's still more fun in the Philippines. Thank you and mabuhay kayo lahat. Thank you, Secretary Puyat, for that uh, most uplifting message and details. Looks like there's some great things at work at the Department of Tourism. Uh, we will be introducing a new panel discussion format in this webinar where we will be engaging in a fireside chat with some of the leaders in the hotel industry. Our first panelist is Undersecretary for Tourism and Development, Benito Bong Bengzen Jr. Under his purview are product and market development, tourism, development planning, research and information management, public affairs, and advocacy. Aside from his role as spokesperson, he also represents the Department of Tourism and International Tourism Group, such as the Asia National Tourism Organization and the World Tourism Organization, amongst others. Thank you for joining us today, Under Secretary Bengtson. Thank you. Welcome. Good morning, Rick. Good morning to everyone, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Very good. Uh, just to kick it off, so uh, Secretary Bengtson, Under Secretary Bengtson, what are the current policies and regulations for hotels? Host, hostels, resorts in light of COVID-19 pandemic, and how do you see these regulations changing over the next few weeks, months, et cetera? Well, in general terms, the policy thrust is to accelerate the recovery of tourism, um, to help enterprises get back on their feet, including accommodation uh, establishments, while ensuring that um, the health and safety protocols are in place. And this is the reason that um, uh, in, uh, in May, uh, of this year, we issued the memorandum circular which um, defined the guidelines uh, on health and safety for accommodation uh, facilities. And essentially, the idea here is to make sure that um, hotels and other accommodation establishments uh, meet the requirements under a new normal. So in this particular set of guidelines, we talked about um, uh, changes or new procedures, new protocols that have to be in place in the critical touch points, uh, guest handling, concierge, front desk, um, F&B, uh, housekeeping, and other uh, operating areas um, in, um, in, in a hotel. So basically the thrust is to um, um, help prepare the accommodation establishments, uh, meet the requirements of uh, the uh, post-COVID uh, uh, travelers. And uh, as mentioned by the Secretary, we also recognize the fact that um, the upgrade and modernization will entail uh, some capital e uh, expenses on the part of um, the hotels. And that's why we made representations uh, with, uh, with the Board of Investments to expand uh, the coverage of um, renovation to include uh, the COVID proofing or future proofing um, um, projects uh, that uh, the Secretary identified uh, earlier. Uh, Under Undersecretary Bengtson, how do you see the travel bubble concept helping the hotel industry and what are the latest developments in realizing its full potential? Well, there, was a, there was a recent report that came out, a um, recent report from the World Travel and Tourism Council. And um, one thing that, um, is, that uh, was quite interesting is that, uh, as has been mentioned by many speakers and many panelists, uh, the trend in the next few months would be domestic uh, tourism. But the interesting thing that came out in the WTTC report is that uh, there will be greater demand for uh, staycations. And I guess this is one opportunity where uh, the, the hotels you know, can, uh, can take advantage of. Uh, from a destination management uh, point of view, uh, the Philippines being an archipelago offers a lot of opportunities for a uh, travel bubble uh, between island uh, destinations. And this is something that uh, 
we will be exploring in the next uh, few months. We're very happy that uh, Boracay has opened already, uh, although initially only for, um, for local tourists, but eventually the idea is to expand the, the client base to allow uh, you know, domestic visitors and eventually uh, international visitors uh, to, uh, to visit the island. On a broader scale, we are exploring the possibility of uh, tra travel bubble arrangements uh, with the ASEAN member states because we feel that um, the demand uh, for uh, overseas travel would be uh, regional in the next uh, few months. People will start to move around uh, within a certain radius before they decide to do uh, intercontinental travel. So the concept of travel bubbles, I think, is quite interesting and something that we can pursue, especially in the case of the Philippines. And are you seeing changes in travel behavior as a result of the pandemic? And uh, what can we do to gain the confidence of tourism, uh, both local and, and uh, international, to travel? We're seeing already um, changes in consumer behavior and expectations. Uh, even before the borders uh, have opened up completely, uh, you know, a lot of surveys will, will, will show that um, uh, travelers are going to be looking for, um, for different things. The decision-making factors will also change. And one thing that uh, is always high on the list is uh, people will put a premium on the health and safety protocols that are available in a particular destination or, or a, a particular uh, facility. The, set, the other thing that uh, we're, we're going to see a lot more of is that the travelers will be looking for more flexibility in travel arrangements. They're going to look at rebooking, reimbursement policies, uh, and this is something that um, will define uh, the, uh, the behavior of uh, consumers uh, in a post-pandemic uh, era. There will be greater preference for uh, outdoor activities, low density but high value kind of experiential travel. People will still book, look for uh, you know, value for money packages and uh, definitely there will be greater utilization of uh, digital platforms in terms of uh, securing information, in terms of uh, booking uh, and making other uh, arrangements. And the, the, in terms of demographics, we feel that um, the age bracket of uh, between 18 to 35 years old will be the, will be the trailblazers, will be the pioneers once uh, the borders are opened up. These are the people who are uh, probably um, more adventurous uh, in a way and I guess uh, perceived to be less susceptible or vulnerable to, to COVID. So we will see a uh, movement among the younger ones uh, in the next few months. Well, th well thank you so much, uh, Under Secretary uh, Bong Benson, for, uh, for sharing with us uh, uh, some of the excellent initiatives that the Department of Tourism is, is putting in place and uh, looks like there's some great things happening and uh, uh, you have our full support. Thank you. Uh, moving on to um, our next uh, our next panelist, uh, I'd like to uh, 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 basically welcome uh, the Executive Vice President of SM Hotels and Conventions, uh, Peggy Angelis. Uh, welcome, Peggy. Hi, Rick. Thank you for having me. Sure. Uh, Peggy's career in the hotel industry spans three countries and territories, including Thailand, Hong Kong, and the Philippines. Prior to joining, joining the SM Group, Peggy worked for the Shangri-La Group for nearly 25 years, most recently as a Senior Vice President for Sales and Marketing of the Shangri-La Hotel in Hong Kong. Welcome, Peggy, and thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, Peggy, how has the coronavirus pandemic affected SM Hotels and Convention Corp to date, and how has the organization responded and pivoted to these, cha these challenges? Right. Uh, well, since the declaration of the ECQ last uh, March 17, obviously uh, our leisure-oriented hotels like uh, the Alvista and Pico had to temporarily close alongside our SMX convention centers across the countries. But our other hotels like the Conrad Manila Park Inn uh, by Radisson Hotels, which are located in North EDSA, Davao, Iloilo, and Clark, and the Radisson Blue and Cebu continued to operate, but obviously we were strictly complying with the uh, IATF guidelines on which segments we could actually accommodate. The good thing is, as you know, SM normally builds our hotels uh, within a community which has the SM mall, um, office towers, and residences. And with our hotels proximity to these office towers catering to the BPOs, 
our hotels have been able to sustain occupancy by accommodating the BPO room requirements. As you know, while their industry was exempted from closing, there were no local transportation available. So uh, they needed to house them temporarily at nearby hotels. There were also long staying guests that we catered to for those who have checked in prior to March 17. And of course, there were some members of the media that sought uh, accommodation as well. However, just like any other hotel, we foresaw that the BPO market will not be sustainable as the companies were actually preparing them to be able to work from home or even provide for shuttle services. And so true enough, within four to six weeks, most have checked out. This together with the closure of airports and flights being canceled, forced Radisson Blue to also temporarily close since May 1. But then came the repatriation of our overseas Filipino workers and seafarers. I believe that we were one of the hotels to respond to the call of the Department of Tourism in housing uh, our um, OFWs and seafarers. So even as early as April 1st, we reopened um, the Alvista to cater to the first few batches of seafarers who arrived in the Philippines. At that time, the hotel was being bashed, in fact, in social media for having accepted them because obviously it's something new to, to a city, right? But I guess the question is, did we stay open because we wanted to make money? Well, I have to tell you with the rates that we were getting and the limited operations of the hotel, I tell you if I'd be lying if, we, if I say we make profits. We continue to operate only in the spirit of Bayanihan, but also because we wanted to continue to provide livelihood to our employees. We had and still have skeletal staff in place. We house them in the hotels as there still is no local transport. We feed them three times a day and we have to keep them engaged with activities to keep their sanity and to prevent them from having cabin fever protective gears and substantial or ad additional precautionary measures had to be implemented. These all had additional costs. So you can just imagine what kind of PNL we were running. And while the hotels were challenged, again, in the spirit of Bayanihan, our hotels donated shower caps as part of an interim PPE for medical workers and even provided food as well. Financial assistance was also extended to uh, like security guards and other similar positions who could not be asked to report to work. Under the GCQ now, employees are somehow back to work, but obviously the reduced capacity. And so um, they're on reduced work days or on rotation basis. Rick? Okay, very good. Sounds like there's some good things at work. And what, and what are your other plans for reopening the various businesses? All right, well, um, as mentioned by the secretary and USEC, um, there, there have been a lot of uh, regulations that have been issued out by the Department of Tourism. So um, a lot of the things that we're doing now is to comply with the various uh, guidelines. Um, so we had to apply for the certificate of authority to operate, not only for the rooms, but all other permissible facilities of the hotels, which have been issued to our hotels. Some hotels have also been inspected by the Department of Tourism to check on compliance to the guidelines and uh, have been issued what they call the safety first sticker to actually uh, allow them to, to open. And uh, I'm happy to share some of the initiatives put in place by the SM hotels. So installation of thermal scanners instead of handheld temperature readers. Uh, we've also made available hand sanitizers at customer contact areas. Uh, we've provided barriers at the various uh, areas like front desk, concierge, and in f and outlets. The use of the UV ones to sanitize uh, key cards for the guests before we issue them and after we get them back. Um, ensuring that employees are also well protected by giving them PPEs. Um, making available contactless registration and health cards, restaurant menus, and through the use of QR codes. Uh, contactless, 
contactless gateway uh, payment gateways are also in place. Um, we had to reconfigure some of our bed layouts to ensure social distancing, um, provide additional room amenities consisting of masks, hand uh, swipes and sanitizers. Uh, we use the UV lights for disinfection of rooms. And of course, we have to re-engineer the menus of our restaurants as booth space are no longer allowed. And most likely, a la carte will come on meal boxes. Um, of course, even your cutleries are to be placed in individually wrapped. Um, you, you have to individually wrap them and you can't just sort of set them on the table. And at the moment, we're also in the process of purchasing electrostatic sprayers for our properties to ease uh, disinfection or disinfecting. But apart from compliance to the DOT guidance, we are currently working on further boosting our Wi-Fi connectivity or for the foreseen renewed requirements of their customers. Contactless concierge services are also being reviewed. But I think what is most important, Rick, is that with all these initiatives, the communication on all the practices and initiatives being done by the hotels to their main constituent, which is the customer, should be, you cannot over overly communicate it. You, you, you have to put them in every place that they can read because you have to assure them of the safety uh, and hygiene uh, factors that you have put in place at the properties. So you will see them the websites of SM Hotels, SMX, of Conrad and Radisson, whether it's being sustainably safe, clean stay, or DOT's safety first. Right. And how will your future investment plans and uh, business outlook uh, for SM change? Well, before the closure or the lockdown, we actually had ongoing projects, Rick. Um, and um, so we will continue with them. So we have the service apartment and hotel at the Mall of Asia, which will be managed by Lanson Place Hospitality Management. Construction has actually been reactivated. The park in um, Radisson by ba in Bacolod has also um, continued its construction and we're now in the finishing stages and will be operational in early 2021. And then the additional 100 rooms uh, for Park in Clark will be operational by the end of this year. And while the next door SNX Convention Center will open its doors um, mid-2021. And lastly, our SNX in Olongapo, in partnership with the local government, will commence operations late this year. We will also continue with our renovation plans for some of our properties. Um, taking into consideration, obviously, all these new normal uh, features and obviously take advantage of what um, the Department of Tourism has wanted. Okay, and then also, Peggy, finally, what trends are you seeing in the, the hospitality space post-COVID? Where, where are the opportunities? Well, um, as earlier mentioned by both USEC and uh, Secretary, um, guests who will be checking will, in will be leisure first before business travelers. No? With the restrictions in our hotel operations, there will be less covers in the restaurants due to reduced capacities, meeting and function spaces. Um, perhaps we will see a different level of takeout and delivery service as gourmet food may be ordered but could be finished at home. Um, the likelihood of um, hybrid um, conferences and even social events such as weddings, office Christmas parties and other events will become a trend. So there will be a need to boost connectivity. Um, well, there was always been a move to digitize the business. This will be fast tracked and will be on the priority list. Example is the contactless check-in and check-out and the e-concierge as mentioned earlier. Um, I can see that there will be product diversification of the hotel's offerings as the existing low performing assets or facilities of the hotels will be redefined. They will be repurposed and made relevant with new concepts. 
this may be lesser guest floors as guest floors could be converted maybe to some co workspaces or long-term leases. Um, it could be meeting spaces that will also be converted into something else and restaurant concepts will be renewed. Um, who knows, even housekeeping service expertise of hotels may be made available to your homes and also alternative work arrangements may become more permanent than ever. I see that, um, as my husband always says, in every crisis, there is an opportunity. We cannot wait for normalcy to return and as this will be a long shot. The, uh, therefore, we, we should really adopt, adapt, create and innovate and go beyond the survival mode. Hoteliers are always very resilient. We've, we've gone through so many of, of this, um, uh, disasters and what have you. Of course, this pandemic is totally different, but I'm confident we will be able to bounce back as long as the private sector and the government agencies work together hand in hand. Very good. Okay. Well, Peggy, thanks so much uh, for, uh, for your views and uh, thanks so much for uh, SM Hotels for participating today. Thank you, Peggy. Thank you. Uh, moving on to Arthur Gindap, uh, Robinson's Hotels and Resorts. Uh, so Arthur is the Senior Vice President and Business Unit General Manager of Robinson Hotels. Uh, Arthur's, uh, Arthur's a longtime friend. We've done a lot of business with him and some of his past groups when he was with Ascot, et cetera. Art has a career spanning four decades in hospitality, so wealth of experience. His five-year thrust in Robinson's land uh, to drive, is to drive the growth of the company's hotel brands and formats, both local, uh, Go and Summit Hotels, and also international, Holiday Inn, Manila Galleria, Crown Plaza, Manila Galleria, Ducet, Ducetani, uh, Mactan Cebu, and also the Weston Manila Sonata Hotel. Prior to joining uh, RLC, Art worked with Ascot Limited as uh, Vice President and Regional General Manager of both the Philippines and also Thailand, uh, and also was the Vice President of Global Operations and Customer Service. Art, uh, great to have you here today and, and welcome. Can you hear me okay? I can. All right. Where's the fire, Rick? Very good. Very good. Uh, how has the coronavirus pandemic affected Robinson's hotels and resorts? And how has the organization responded and rebounded to these challenges? Uh, I think Peggy answered for all of us. <laughs> because uh, it's very, very similar to what's going on. Uh, we're, we're basically taking essential business. And um, so the last few months uh, since the ECQ had started, again, a, a majority of that business was uh, BPOs. And uh, so we were pretty full. We have 20 operating hotels. And at that time, we were operating as many as uh, 13, 14 hotels. And uh, so from the 1st of June, when it was relaxed, GCQ, so to say, uh, and, and it wasn't really, um, it wasn't really required that the BPOs would stay. So now we've, uh, lost that business service and we still have some and we're uh, currently operating about eight of our, eight of our hotels so we've had to uh, temporarily cease operation in, uh, in a few of our hotels because um, because uh, you know the essential business is basically not much out there we're taking OFWs um, some of the hotels honestly speaking have also been uh, quarantine centers and um, uh, we've opened some of our provincial hotels to be able to accommodate that as quarantine centers, also as part of our support to uh, com to community, to government, and so on. But it's been tough. It's a it's a it's a tough time for us, and this is um, this is where we are looking at uh, new business models temporarily that we can put into, say, our budget brand goals, such as um, uh, dorm type accommodation, so that because you know transportation is a is a is a challenge. And will continue to be a challenge because even if it normalizes, you, you, you'll still have that social distancing. So that GP that takes, uh, you know, 15 people will only be able to accommodate half of that. So we think that there's a market there. We've actually launched and we've seen a pretty good, pretty good response on that one. Uh, short term uh, plug and play type offices uh, as well. Um, so, yeah, I mean, our whole model is really trying to be very agile. Uh, on, on how we run our business and, um, and uh, really, uh, I guess, uh, 
keep it going until it normalizes because it's going to be quite a while before it does. Yeah, thanks, Art. I think thanks for your unvarnished view. I think when, when uh, in the hotel business, obviously those one-day lease contracts uh, um, are, are always uh, are always tough. But uh, you now, what are what what is Robinson's uh, plan for reopening the business? And uh, so, what what's the game plan there? What's the playbook looking like? You know, we're just we're monitoring the demand basically. Uh, you know, if you look at uh, currently, even uh, in, in areas that have so we're 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 nationwide. And then in areas where we have uh, the modified GCQ, there's still no movement happening there. There are no flights in or very limited flights that are coming in. So these hotels that one would think that we can start to open because uh, the channels are allowed to open, uh, is not quite there yet. So we're really monitoring that between uh, flight availability, between uh, you know, looking at what the demand is on the ground, seeing what kind of uh, demand is coming in from bookings online and so on. So uh, that's what we're doing now. We are, again, we, we really have to look at uh, really taking any, any, any and all types of business in, in our hotels. And uh, so we're very flexible. I think with our organization, what we've learned uh, over the last few months is, is really to be agile. And I think when we start to uh, become as big as, as we have become, uh, this is the right time also for us to really redesign our business, uh, redesign our processes, and really rebuild for, for the future. Um, but we're getting ready. We're getting, all our hotels are now DOT uh, accredited, and, uh, and we, can, we can move pretty quickly. Again, these are our local brands, which are the Go Hotels and the Summit Hotels. These ones, we can, we can move pretty quickly to open it. Our international brands are... Uh, so Crown Plaza Holiday Inn out of uh, Ortega Center is um, actually pretty busy now with, uh, so we are busy with BPOs, but uh, now busy with, uh, with uh, quarantine type business. And um, our Dusitani is uh, unfortunately in Maktan, it's a leisure market. And we see it's gonna be quite a while before that comes back and whether that, that demand will come back in the next uh, couple of months. Uh, my, feel is, uh, my feel is a little bit longer than that. So uh, again, we're, we're taking this opportunity to look at our organization, tighten processes um, so that when we get out of this uh, period that we're in, which might take 12 to 18 months, we'll be in pretty good shape. Thanks. Yeah, the, the, obviously the Robinsons group, like SM, has been some of the savviest investors. So sometimes you say maximum pessimism, maximum opportunity. I mean, reading the tea leaves, uh, Arthur, uh, what are your future? What, what are the group's future investment plans, and and how and how do you see that that business? Uh, what, what's the business outlook? Yeah, you know, I've been telling my guys that a uh, couple of things. One is that we really need to be optimistic for the future, but we also have to be realistic. You can be killed by being too optimistic, and then you get caught in a, in not a good situation. So uh, we're trying to balance that one. We're very aggressive, and we're on our and we'll continue to be, but. Uh, before the lockdown, before the ECQ came, we had about a little over 20 projects uh, under uh, that we had started. Um, most all of that are going to continue. It's just that uh, two things. One is that we've deferred uh, a number of them for later, uh, simply because if you start to open these things anytime soon, demand just won't be there. So uh, we've deferred some for uh, for the future, but we're moving with about seven properties that we are uh, moving uh, full blast on. Um, and we'd like to open by, say, uh, uh, next year. And, uh, and we'll continue to, to really, uh, you know, our, our goal is to be the number one, to be the largest hotel company by 2023, 2024. And uh, we still have that within our sites. Yeah, our, 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 Arthur, we were talking earlier, I know you've been through you know, 9-11, Asian financial crisis, SARS, global financial crisis, you've, you've been through the wars like many of us. Um, what are the trends you're seeing in hospitality uh, post-COVID-19 COVID uh, for the group and, and what lessons have you learned from, uh, from the previous wars? Uh, agility again, I gotta say it again, I've said it two or three times uh, now, I think we have a very agile that we build uh, to be able to make decisions and turn on a dime, so to say. Um, you, you need to be able to uh, really adjust in, in terms of your operating models. 
um, which I think I've been, I'm proud to say that over the last two, three months that um, even though we're only operating half our inventory, we're still okay. Um, you know, we're not, we're not bleeding, so to say, right? So um, we, we want get, to get to that day where we can fight a full battle. So you know, that's what I'm telling the team. Agile, be bold, and be brave. However, having said that, we also have to be able to fail. And if we fail, we fail fast and try something again. So uh, that's our uh, motto. That's our drive. Uh, but for the next little while, it'll be, again, as mentioned by uh, Secretary Bern, Berna and Secretary Bong, that it'll be a push on domestic tourism. Uh, digital transformation is, is critical. It's, uh, that is a big push from uh, digital touch points, uh, self-check-in, you know, those kind of things. That's something that is here to stay. And so we had started this before, and we are aggressively continuing that. And then our push on cleanliness and sanitation. Uh, we've uh, launched a program called Circle of Clean, and that covers everything uh, guests would, would experience pre-arrival uh, all the way to departure. And uh, you know, even when we clean a room, for example, we seal that room with uh, this seal, just like uh, uh, you know you see in hospitals when they seal the bathrooms with this seal. So once that room is sanitized and clean, we seal it. Uh, but we think that's going to be the the thrust for probably a while, if not just be the standard moving forward. But we um, again, just to to say, we want to be. Uh, bullish we want to be positive but we need to be realistic with things and make sure that we are managing and keeping on top of things uh, for the next uh, minimum 12 months so be agile and mobile in a volatile environment um and brave. The, and brave. you know the the last question i've got is is you know it, globally um you know hotel you don't see a lot of hotels in asia pacific trade um the the, the volume activity in the hotel sector because it's usually uh you know, families that own its dynastic holdings. So do you think we'll see more activity now and opportunities for international hotel investors and international brands to come in, into the Philippines? Because, you know, we at Santos Knight Frank, we see more interest both on the sell side, the buy side, the financing side, the retrofit, retrofitting of hotels and interest because probably because of the volatility and we've seen in the last 26 years. What are your thoughts? Uh, two things. One, one, Rick, is that uh, we've seen that happening over the last uh, three years. Even in my past uh, company, uh, we had grown tremendously over the last, um, you know, five, five years or so. Uh, so, so and, and you can see that, you know, years ago where people didn't want to enter the Philippines, that had really changed over the last five to eight years. So that is a, uh, I think that's, uh, that's, I think that'll, that'll continue. Having said that, I also believe that the, the country has come to a, a certain uh, level where we're also, you know, locally, we can, we can be as good as the international brands. And I think what, we'll, what you'll see happening is what happened in Thailand 10, 15 years ago, where there was a, uh, a development of good, good local brands, which, uh, as you know, now these good local brands out of Thailand have actually even gone international. Mm -hmm. I think you'll see a birth of that also happening um, in, in our country and, uh, Robinson's is actually on the forefront of developing um, some good local brands. That's good. That's great to know. And thanks for your uh, global perspective. And uh, clearly look for uh, international investors to come in and also uh, Philippine multinational brands to go uh, across the country and global. So thank you so much for your, your perspective, Arthur, and uh, great to have you on the panel. Thanks, Ray. Uh, uh, now I'd like to introduce uh, Bruce Winton. Um, really from an international investor operator's point of view. Obviously, Marriott's one of the largest hotel brands and biggest players in the, in the world. So uh, welcome to uh, Bruce Winton, uh, who is the uh, Cluster General Manager of Marriott International Philippines. Bruce is also uh, a longtime friend, and uh, we set a number of boards together. Uh, Bruce was named the General Manager of the Marriott Hotel uh, in 2013, and then Cluster General Manager in February of 2017 to include Marriott's new brands, Courtyard by Marriott Iloilo, Clark Marriott Hotel, and Sheraton Manila Hotel. Uh, in July this year, he, he, he will celebrate 30 years with Marriott International, a uh, great milestone after working his way up the chain through the ranks of culinary intern at his first hotel in Hartford, Connecticut in 1989 to his current role here in Manila. 
Uh, he's lost that Hartford, Connecticut accent, so we'll speak in, with a Scottish accent. But Bruce, welcome and glad you can join us today. Thanks, Rick. Yeah, uh, thanks for reminding everybody how old I am. But uh, anyway, glad to be here. Very good. Um, qu questions. Uh, Bruce, how has the coronavirus pandemic affected uh, the Marriott Hel Hotel Group over the last three months? And, and how has Marriott responded to the challenges op slash opportunities? Well, it's always tough to go last because, uh, you know, the uh, very talented speakers before me had covered a lot of those things. But um, yes, we've heard the word unprecedented many, many times. Uh, Arnie Sorensen, our CEO, uh, mentioned it, uh, that, uh, you know, the, the combined effects of the global financial crisis of 08 and 9-11 combined were not even half as impactful as this. Um, Mari International in April uh, saw a 90 percent uh, ref par decline year over year globally so uh, that's that's pretty much uh, the impact now that was the the, the rock bottom um, <clears throat> of course we're we're global uh, we're, we're 7500 hotels in 134 countries uh, and so things are moving at different paces uh, in different places um, China is starting to recover um, uh, we, we can see that happening uh, and that's a, a sort of a, something that we're focused on to, to see what the indicators are. Um, but, you know, how do we handle it? Well, just, you know, basically we're an operator, Rick. And um, so we've got three very important stakeholders to, to, to look after in, in all situations. That We've got our customers, we've got our owners, uh, and we've got our employees, our associates. Um, so obviously the, the first stage here uh, as, as we went into this thing was to, to take care of those three stakeholders. So... You know, on the customer side, we just try to make sure that we did good by everybody. You know, zero cancellation fees, complete flexibility, complete peace of mind, stop people worrying. I know that a lot of people had plans like, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? Am I going to lose money? Am I going to do that? Am I going to be able to do this? So the first thing is really just take care of our customers um, and make sure that, they, that you know, they'll remember how you handled the situation uh, as we move forward. So that was very important to us. Um, obviously, being active in the community. Uh, lots of CSR projects over the last uh, three or four months, whether we're feeding frontliners or, um, you know, supplying um, sanitation kits and doing other things like that, you know, that this kept the staff motivated. Uh, so, so being a good, a good community citizen was very important. To our owners, obviously, to be extremely agile, uh, as, as Art said, we had to, you know, control costs uh, as much as we possibly can, um, taking some, you know, some fairly robust measures uh, to, to, to make sure that there was, you know, uh, cost containment, but, but also looking at, you know, business opportunities, wherever they exist, you know, uh, when one door closes, another door opens. And uh, we've, we've been looking for ways to both, you know, both serve, serve the community uh, and, and serve some of our, our, our clients that, that had needs to, over these times, uh, you know, within the parameters set forth by the IATF and DOT, of course. Um, and then also looking at, you know, long-term CapEx planning and, and uh, how we were, you know, uh, redirecting funds and uh, making funds available back to owners uh, that were otherwise set for long-term projects to, 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 to take care of immediate needs. Uh, that's something that was uh, welcomed uh, in many areas. Uh, and then, of course, with our associates, the, you know, their health and their well-being uh, were extremely important, uh, first and foremost. So, you know, give, giving people peace of mind, training, um, you know, just just constant communication uh, about what the present and the future held for them, being compassionate, empathetic to their needs. Uh, obviously, and, and also, you know, while we were cutting costs, we were also looking at financial assistance programs and how to keep people fluid uh, over time, keep them working, um, you know, through repurposing, retraining, uh, and also having uh, financial and wellness assistance programs. Bruce, uh, you know, I, I know Bruce well, and, you know, he's been a great driver of the Marriott brand and expansion hotels. And, you know, and, and, you know, Bruce, it was all going so well for travel and tourism hotels around the world. And Department of Tourism has been doing a great job. And Secretary Bouillat and, and USEC Bengston, obviously doing wonderful work. Uh, and then, then we had a global health pandemic. And it doesn't, doesn't it's unlike SARS, it affected everybody, right? So with the result in economic uh, black Swan, and then in parts of the world um, where merits affected a social justice Black Swan. So clearly, um, in light of all that, what is the Marriott Group's, you know, plan and um, playbook for preparing to return to 
travel and give people confidence to travel, whether it's the Philippines, uh, Pan-Asia, or just get people back into hotels? Well, you know, it's uh, the, the recovery plans, it's really, you know, it's, it, it's two, you know, there's two, there's two parts to it. There's the, the business recovery, and then there's obviously the operational uh, changes and everything else that you need to put in place. And, and I think they've been covered uh, tremendously well by Peggy. I, I couldn't add really much more to what Peggy said. She made a very, very detailed presentation there. Uh, and we're, we are all looking at that and following the guidelines. But, you know, on, on a, for a, from our business recovery model, you know, we really had three phases, which was mentioned already. You know, first phase was do good uh, and give hope, you know. Uh, the second phase is to, to, to build confidence, you know, and, and then starting with domestic travel, you know, I, I really, you know, we really see sort of 2020 moving towards domestic, 2021, you know, it's starting to scratch at regional and then 2022 really before it becomes global again. Uh, and so we're building our, our, you know, our recovery plans, you know, around that. Um, and, and then, you know, we're also, we're, we're kind of, we're looking to future sell. Uh, you know, we need to really kind of kickstart it again. So, you know, there's a, there's a few sort of buy now, stay later kind of programs going on. Um, we need to really inspire travel. And, um, you know, I think that, you know, what I would add to that, you know, it's, it's, uh, there's been a lot of rhetoric, a lot of chatting, you know, a lot of talking, we're doing it again today. And, and it's, and it's extremely important to do that, to, to, to motivate, to keep the level of optimism up there and, and to inspire people to, to, to keep going and what, is otherwise a catastrophic situation for, for tour, uh, tourism and travel. But, you know, all these standards that we're putting in place and every, every brand, every, whether it's a local brand or a, or a global brand has got their plan. Uh, but the, the key's in the execution. Uh, and what we're doing right now is, is making sure that we're ready to execute everything that we're committing to, you know? So, our, you know, Marriott's program is commitment to clean. Uh, and, and, and it's, it's all going to be in the execution. I, I read a travel blog uh, just a couple of days ago, uh, and it was about a guy that got back on the road in the U.S. Uh, as the U.S. started to open up state by state. And he stayed at three of the big brands. I won't say who. Um, you know, and, and basically, his, uh, the observation was that, yeah, you're, you're talking to talk, but you're not walking the walk. And uh, that just goes to show that the consumer will be really, really looking and paying attention to all of the things that we're doing. Uh, and, and what is going to get us on the road to recovery is consumer confidence, pure and simple. We can say all we want, we can plan all we want, we can put all the plans in place that we want, but if that consumer does not have the confidence to travel, it's gonna be a long, uh, hard, rocky road. Absolutely, and well said, and that's really where the rubber hits the road in terms of execution, especially in the, uh, in the rough and tumbly emerging markets. So, Bruce, based on your experience, what are the key lessons learned from our neighbors in Asia, uh, Asia Pac, and how does the Philippine hotel industry's experience compares with some of these neighboring markets, say ASEAN? Yeah, well, you know, there's, uh, I mean, there's, there, there's, there's some bright spots there, you know, some silver linings. Um, we talk, we've had a lot about domestic travel, and uh, over the last few years, domestic travel made up about 85% of the tourism economy in the Philippines. Uh, despite all these exciting numbers about increases in, for, in foreign arrivals, it's still a predominantly domestic-based business, uh, which at a time like this is a good thing. Uh, obviously, consumer spending is going to be a little bit impacted. You know, people have you know, feel on the pinch a little bit. Uh, so there's not as much money flying around, but still, uh, some friends of mine in the industry in, in Koh Samui, for example, Koh Samui in Thailand just opened, but historically they've only had 15% domestic travel. So they haven't really opened their borders. And so they were given the opportunity to open, but nobody's open because there's, they don't see any point. They don't see the value in reopening. So that's definitely, a, 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 I think, a positive indicator for, for the Philippines. Um, you know, and, and then China uh, is obviously the first market on the road to recovery. They, they were the first ones affected uh, and the first ones to really start moving again. And I think in the last 60 days, the increase in the movement of people, the increase in occupancies and, and RevPAR in China has been quite um, encouraging. Now, of course, the Chinese handle things a little differently than other countries. Um, they have a little bit more, uh, more control and, um, on, on how things happen. But you know, to go from sort of five percent occupancy to forty percent occupancy, market by market, in sixty days' time is encouraging. And uh, you know, can that be replicated in the Philippines? You know, uh, as we said, despite some of the uh, 
you know, uh, the, the reduction of the quarantine restrictions, um, it is still difficult to move from region to region across the archipelago. So, you know, uh, just just trying to get business travel uh, moving again is is uh, is going to be critical to our industry. And uh, so, being able to fly from, you know, NCR to to the Visayas. Uh, we understand the challenges, but that's really, you know, what's going to kickstart the business for us here in the Philippines. And, and Bruce, uh, what is your outlook on, on business and leisure travel in the, both, both in the Philippines for the balance of this year and, and Asia PAC uh, and moving into 2021? How are, how are the tea leaves looking the rest of this year and into 2021? Well, you know, I mean, yeah, let's focus on domestic market because that's really what we're talking about in the next 12 months. Um, and and I think the uh, I think the the Philippine market is resilient. You can you can see um, you know anybody who went to the mall three weeks ago when uh, we came out of ECQ would you know would have seen the difference if they went last weekend. Um, I, I think uh, consumer confidence builds quite rapidly. You're just gonna dip your toe in the water. Next thing you know, you're jumping in. So. We're going to remain optimistic there and say that, you know, let's, you know, let's start getting folks coming back to our hotels. Our restaurants are open, uh, you know, obviously with reduced capacity. But I think once they come once or twice uh, and realize, you know, that, uh, that, that, that it's, you know, it's safe and they've missed it, that uh, things will pick up from there. I mean, you know, we have to be, we have to be optimistic. Uh, we're, you know, uh, you know, we, 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 we're, we're in it for the long haul. And um, I think, you know, the, the, the key to success will be honestly sort of, you know, the, the sort of repurposing, or sorry, my office phone there, you know, is, is you know, repurposing, retooling, retraining, restructuring, um, and, 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 and that agility that, that Art mentioned. You know, I think a lot of the changes and a lot of the, the things that we're doing right now will not be undone. Uh, and, and, and we will travel again, the, the industry will bounce back. Uh, and I think when we do the, the value there to the investor will be in all the learnings that we've, we've put in and, 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 and changes that we've put into place now. And so I think three years from now, the industry will be leaner, meaner and more profitable. Um, but at the same time, you know, with a slightly, you know, with, a, with, a, with an adjusted uh, consumer driven experience uh, based on this experience so you know health and safety sanitation will be the new luxury it might be a little bit more simplistic there might be slightly you know more focus on one thing and less focus on another uh, and i say a leaner operation uh, long term wise uh, will also you know benefit uh, the investors um uh, you know and so bruce right. great, great great advice i think we, we have you know we have a lot of viewers out there today. Some of them are, are small operators, some are large operators, some are Taipan investors, some are professional managers, some are building boutique chains. I see Hanky Lee out there from Henry Hotels. So what's your one piece of advice that you can give to that audience to get them through this, this bump in the road, this crisis? Whew, um, well, you know, uh, you know, whether you're, you know, I mean, obviously, you know the weight. The weight's on the weight's on the investor's shoulder, right? I mean, you know, there's, you know, there's uh, depending on 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 how leveraged you are. I mean, obviously, you, you know, you need to you need to be running uh, a profitable hotel, and um, and and what's you know, what what you know, what's going to make that hotel profitable uh, in the in in the near to midterm future, and um, and that is something that that listens to the marketplace uh, to to really understand what the marketplace needs. And, and to be able to um, put in an efficient, agile operation that can accommodate those needs. And that, that does not mean, you know, going back to doing what you were doing before. Uh, you, we're, we are doing things differently now. We will continue to do things differently. But again, you know, new business opportunities open up as well, you know, uh, and we, we can see that. Um, I mean, just, you know, for example, one of, you know, my, my hotel here in Manila, we've done a tremendous amount of outside catering. And that's not something that we used to think we needed because, you know, logistically it was more difficult. Uh, from a GOP margin, it was, you know, more challenged because, you know, you just had to move stuff around, whereas doing stuff uh, on your in your own facilities. But now, you know, just opened the door to, to realize that, uh, you know, wow, there's just there's so many more opportunities out there. So, 
you know, don't, don't close your mind to anything. Uh, you know, really sort of keep your eyes wide open right now and, and, and see what you can learn because uh, we are learning a lot. And I think that that will behoof us uh, positively in the, in the future. Very good. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Bruce Winton Marriott International. Thank you, Arthur Gindap, Robinson's Hotel, the Go and the Gawkin Way family. Thank you, P Peggy Angeles from the SM Hotels and Convention Corp and the, uh, the, uh, the C family. And thank you so much, uh, Yusek uh, Bong Benson, uh, for, for your remarks. And a big thanks to Secretary uh, uh, of the DOT, uh, uh, Berna Romula Puyat. Thank you very much. And uh, I think we'll now move into uh, our question and answer session led by our own uh, Santos Knight, Frank, Frank Cash Salvador of Investment and Capital Markets. Cash is also a big part of our hotel advisory team and has advised many of the leading international and Philippine hospitality groups. Cash, over to you. Hi, thanks, Ray. Uh, we've been getting a lot of interesting questions. Um, I know Ms. Peggy has already been answering some and um, under secretary has also been answering some in the, um, in the, the Q&A board. But I think um, just to shed light on those questions or to, to give light to our viewers for this morning, we'd also like to, to repeat some and um, direct them to, to a couple of our panelists. Um, I think this question can be answered or we'd like to get the views from, from Arthur and, and Bruce. Um, uh, Maria Aquino is asking, um, with COVID proofing initiatives being done in your properties, training on staff, improving properties, um, what is the impact on price of room, food or services, or ultimately the quality of service. Do you think it's gonna be more expensive now? Uh, she's kind of asking, what is your forecast on the pricing for the hotels? Bruce, go ahead. Okay, thanks, Arthur. Um, well, I, you know, I, I think that um, a balanced approach is, is necessary here. Um, you know, as I said, the, the, the consumer spending is, is, has been affected. And um, you know we need, we're, we're sensitive to that, but I think also the consumer will realize that the the operations are becoming more perhaps more expensive to run. Uh, we have got more equipment, more 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 capital funding required to, to make changes and adjustments to the properties, uh, more amenities in the room, on one hand perhaps. Um, but I think you know what our message is is you know try to uh, try to maintain the status quo on on rate. I think. You know, pushing the prices up is 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 ambitious at at, at best, uh, unlikely, uh, but deeply discounting to try to drive uh, business into your hotel is going to hurt everybody uh, and may not be feasible. You know, so I, I think if you if I if I was going to make a broad stroke statement, I would just say, let's just keep things the way they are and add as much value and as much confidence as possible. Um, but, but, you know, if, if we get in a price war, we'll kill what little industry there's left for us to, to eke a, a living out of, right? So, you know, if the consumer out there say, well, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to go, if it's not 80% off, well, that, you, we just might not be open for you. Then, you know, I mean, we can't, you know, that's just a reality. So, um, and again, you know, this is all about maintaining employment and keeping people working and all the rest of it. So let's, let's as a consumer, let's be fair. As an operator, let's be fair. Uh, and let, but it's also be practical. Um, Arthur, yeah, so for me, I, I think there's two parts to that question. It's a now question and what happens in the future. The now question is that the rates are, are, actually, are actually being driven down. And uh, so that's the reality. And uh, our position simply is if we can keep our hotels open so that we can keep our associates employed, then uh, we're good. And uh, sure, we'd like to make money, but um, you know, I think in the in the overall of the the bigger picture, that's what we um, that's what we look at. In the future, yeah, our operating costs will continue to increase because of this. Having said that, we're also monitoring behavior of uh, things such as um, daily cleanliness uh, or cl daily cleaning of rooms. Uh, again, if I were to start traveling, I wouldn't want my room cleaned if I were going to stay for a couple of nights. I mean, that's that's, I think, uh, so we're monitoring that, whether maybe there could be some offsetting practices that, that might be saved and not be used anymore or not be required anymore. So there is no set answer to that one. Just two different scenarios. There's, an, there's a now scenario and, and in the future. But um, in the future, yeah, we'll, um, we'll have to be very creative how we, uh, how we run our business. 
Thank you so much for that. Um, we have another question here. I think uh, Ms. Peggy and uh, Undersecretary Benito Benson can, can answer this. Um, this is actually very interesting because um, you, we know that the, the survey from DOT earlier said that you know a lot of people has sun and beach as their top choice to do right after this, and then you know road trips. Um, and now um, Aimee Ruth Villahuan is asking, what are your thoughts on people who are now afraid to travel? How will they gain their confidence again? Um, if you could share your thoughts and insights on this. Uh, Ms. Peggy, you can go first. Okay, well, obviously, as far as the SM group is concerned, we have um, the Pico Sands Hotel, and um, that's just a, a drive away from Metro Manila, right? And we definitely offer sun and beach um, and sand to, to include that as well. And um, to gain the confidence of um, those who would like to experience or go back to the beach, I think it's really to reinforce um, the information, the communication of all the positive initiatives we're doing as far as safety protocols are concerned because that is also one of the major factors that um, the domestic leisure travelers are considering as per the survey right so um I, like like we said earlier we, we should just continue to communicate with with the customers uh, through various platforms whether social media or website on all these protocols that are um, being complied with or if we're going beyond the protocols in fact um, to ensure the safety and hygiene of, of the place. But, um, you know, when you're under the sun, I think, and there's so much in the beach, there's just so much social distancing that you can do. Um, I, I mean, I think that's the best place to, to be and, um, and enjoy. And, and like, you know, we, we've sort of reopened our um, country club in, um, in Pico. And um, what's interesting is, although it's for members only as of this moment, um, we have very strong uh, Wi-Fi connectivity that you can actually work from there while you're on the beach enjoying the sun. So that's, that's your work from home location. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you so much for that, Ms. Peggy. Um, I'm just like that, thanks, on. I think that um, the protocol have to be in place. So when you talk about um, health and safety protocols, you're talking about those that will be provided by the destination, those that will be provided by the tourism establishments. And of course, there are also protocols that will have to be followed by the traveler himself. In building the confidence, it's very important to come up with a um, strategic, strategic communications plan. And this is really what we're doing in the DOT to communicate to would-be travelers that uh, the safety protocols are being put into place. Now, as far as the travel patterns are concerned, we feel that um, in the near future, people will be traveling short distances by land. Maybe they'll take their own cars, their own vans. And as the confidence level um, returns, then they'll start traveling longer distances. They'll start going to the beaches and eventually they'll probably start um, taking flights once they are available already. So two key things here would be to make sure that the safety, the health and safety protocols are in place. And second is to get the message out that uh, yes, it is safe to travel. Thank you for that. Um, um, we have so many more questions, but I don't think we can add, we can cater to them all. To all the viewers, we'll try to answer to all your questions. We'll try to send out an email um, and, and do our best to, to advise on everything. Um, I think I'll leave it back to Rick Santos, Rick. Thank you, Cash, and thank you once again to our panelists. Uh, I'm truly inspired by our panelists and the, the Secretary of Tourism. I'm going to go out, stand up paddleboarding, surfing, go out and ride my KTM and do, play a little bit of golf. There's so many great things to, to hop in the car and do. So, But once again, thanks so much. And uh, uh, as, we, uh, as, we, as we get ready for our close, I think of no other person to sum up the discussions and to say a few words. Uh, about our panels, our discussion today, then uh, Art, Art Lopez, uh, who is the president of the Philippine Hotel Owners Association. He's a long-term friend of the Santos family, he grew up with my father, father in Zamboanga City. Uh, the Philippine Hotel Owners Association is an association of major hotel owners with close to 300 hotels in their portfolio. 
Art has an extensive experience in senior positions in general management of international hotel brands in Australia, New Zealand, Malaysia, and the Philippines. He's also been a consultant to several hotel projects in Malaysia, uh, Tokyo, Japan, the Cook Islands, and across the Philippines. Art is the owner and principal consultant of AML Hotel Consultancy with a vast network of international and local hotel associates who are experts in all aspects of hotel design, technical services, and management. His firm specializes in general management, casino design development, and technical services. Art's one of the most experienced uh, players in the industry and one of the top minds in hotels across Asia Pacific. Art, thank you for joining us today. Over to you, Art. Thank you, Rick. Am I on? Yes. Rick? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mabuhay and aloha. <laughs> you have the change of costume. <laughs> anyway, thank you, Rick, for inviting me. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Secretary Berna for all her initiatives to help uh, the hotel industry and the tourism industry at large. Uh, to get over this pandemic. Uh, this pandemic will fundamentally uh, change how hotels do business in the next five years. Although it will take at least three years after a vaccine is found, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for people to gain the confidence uh, to travel and get over the fear factor. It might encourage you to know, and I'm sure you all know, that uh, Korea hotel occupancy is running now at 30% occupancy. 30%. Mainly domestic uh, tourism because of a very diligent uh, tracing and testing. So it gives confidence to the, uh, to the locals. So 30% is a lot. Without the BPOs and the OWP, OFWs, you know, we're running about 1% or 2% uh, occupancy in the Philippines. And even restaurants, uh, I always tell my, my friends, don't rush into opening the restaurants because people are still scared to go to, to, to crowded places. I made a survey last Father's Day, uh, most hotel restaurants, uh, most, I said, probably not all, were empty. And fast food open for dining, also empty. So my advice to everyone is to take your time. Wait a bit, okay? Uh, because you lose more money that way. This crisis will have a lasting impact on our customer needs. We need to innovate both the country and the hotel operations. Hotel management must have the expertise, resources, and commitment to pursue new growth successfully. Changes brought about by COVID-19 will be a big opportunity for growth in our industry. So we have to prepare for it now. now prepare, okay? Old hotels, I encourage them to start fixing your hotels, ren renovating them. You can now get uh, incentives from uh, the government to renovate. So, you know, you should be ready by the time uh, uh, confidence uh, to travel is back. And it will be big time when it, it happens. I believe, as a hotel hotelier, that this pandemic and the aftermath of the pandemic will be the most challenging times of a manager's career. It will also change the outlook of hotel developers and investors. There'll be more three-star to budget to three-star hotels that will be built. And also local brands uh, will start to mushroom. It's really more of cost. And, and uh, if we're looking at mainly domestic tourism, uh, of course, uh, uh, you know, that will really be big help to your bottom line, okay? While the international brands will attract the higher end uh, customers, uh, but that's probably only about 10%. Uh, 
domestic travel is before before COVID is over 100 million, and as the government is now improving all the airports, the Roro especially, uh, you know, this will double. So get ready for it. But in the meantime, don't hurry. You know, do it slowly. Thank you very much. And uh, again, greetings to all uh, my hotel colleagues and other guests. Thank you. Thank you, Art uh, and Buenas. Uh, Art, Art Lopez, head of the Philippine Hotel Owners Association. Also, thanks to uh, the Hotel Restaurant Association of the Philippines, its president, Eugene Yap. Thank you to the Hotel Resort and Restaurant Association of Cebu and its president, uh, Carlos Suarez. Thank you to the Hotel Sales and Marketing Association with its chairman, Marge Munsayak, and also President Christine Ann Ibarreta. Uh, and a big thanks to our partner, the British Chamber of Commerce, uh, uh, Bill Bailey and Chris Nelson. Thanks uh, for all the panels, once again, for sharing all your insights in the Department of Tourism. If you have any questions about any of our discussion or information or want copies, please contact, contact us at Santos Knight Frank. If you're thinking about buying, selling, financing, retrofitting, rebranding, let us know. If you have any questions, please get back to us. Our contact details are, are, are on the screen. Thanks very much, and uh, let's all do a favor. Let's go out and travel domestically. Let's buy Filipino, and let's uh, spend some time at our local Philippine resorts, and let's all not be scared to travel. Let's get out there. Let's be safe, and let's say something good about the Philippines because it's more fun here. Thanks very much. Thanks for all the panelists. Mabuhay. <laughs>